Hello, today we'll look at uh, diabetic infections and the treatment of it. We dealt with the evaluation, so the diagnosis in another video. So let's uh, look at the treatment now. Uh, we need to first, first of all understand the risk factors very shortly. We have peripheral artery disease, meaning blood flow to the wounds that the patient have. We have a diabetic patient now with some wound, which is very common. We need to check uh, wounds in every diabetic patient every year uh, and because we know the risk for amputations are very high. So high levels of amputation by diabetic foot, remember this. Therefore, check all diabetic patients. And now the patient shows his wound and the risk factors for it are peripheral artery disease. So we regularly need to check the peripheral artery disease in this patient because blood supply to the wounds are important for the healing. And if the peripheral artery disease is causing a narrowing of these arteries, then no blood flow uh, is, is, is made. Therefore, no immune system can reach the point of infection that will develop in this wound. The other risk factor is, of course, neuropathy, meaning some problems with nerves. So we have problems with arteries, problems with nerves. Nerves are important because you can feel pain. And if you never feel pain, then you go on with uh, walking in shoes, for example, or walking on sharp objects that is uh, having a very high level of mechanical loading. And therefore, you will hurt your skin. You will uh, have skin cracks and then infection comes in, goes into the wound, and then uh, they thrive there. So they have uh, no blood supply, they have no immune system to attack them, they have uh, no uh, smart human that can feel the pain, so it's going on uh, and, and the patient never feels the pain and therefore this uh, infection party, we can say, goes on forever. And then the patient goes, comes to the doctor now and he uh, doesn't even notice that he has some wound, so please check his legs please tell the patient to uh, take his clothes off and then we will check his leg and we will see yeah that he has a wound it has happened many times for me also that the patient comes in and he says that he has no problems he comes in for, with something else for example blood pressure then i say please uh, you are a diabetic patient can we check your foot and then i see that the foot is black so the toes are already black and then he's surprised that he have not even noticed it. So you see, pa patient ev doesn't even notice that the, that the toes are black. They're completely dead and you need to amputate the toes and he didn't even feel that. Can you imagine that? He doesn't feel that the toe is completely dead. So then you can imagine that he doesn't feel that the shoe is not really properly fit. So therefore you have to check if the shoes are properly fit. You have to recommend some good shoes to these patients. So, these are the steps that we have to do. For example, mechanical offloading is very important. These are the shoes. We have to mechanically offload the patients. Then, we have to check the peripheral artery disease status uh, and talk with vascular surgeon if, if needed. Then, neuropathy, talk with neurologist, give medications for neuropathy, for neuropathic pain also. There, so, this is the dilemma. S some patient doesn't feel pain from the cracks or the wounds, but some patients feel pain in the night. So they lie in the bed in the night, that is some other type of pain that is also called neuropathic pain. So they don't feel it during the day and then suddenly in the night they feel pain. This has to be treated with uh, cooperation with neurologists. Then we need to debride the wound. So we need to talk with the surgeon also. So as you see, I have mentioned many doctors here. So we have a cooperation of uh, a very large group of doctors, vascular surgeons, general surgeons, neurologists, internal medicine, because now we are dealing with infections in today's presentation. We're, de we're dealing with di diabetic foot infections. So we have a wound that is causing an inf infection that has to be treated with antibiotics, either at home, then we call it outpatient, or we treat it in the hospital, then we call it hospital, hospital hospitalization. Uh, so then we give intravenous medication. And when we debride this wound now, let's go back, we debride it with the wound, we have to first irrigate it, we have to debride it, and thereby we cleanse the wound when we do an irrigation, with, uh, we cleanse it with, of all these bacteria that we have, the uh, sharp debridement that we have is when we cut out the, uh, the wounds and we cut out the bacteria, one can say, the dead tissue, and then we have some healthy, good living tissue that can then uh, uh, heal better, can heal quicker, and so on. Therefore, debridement is very important. Then we go, go on, of course, with dressings. We can have uh, many types of dressings. We will deal with, with that in another video. So what type of dressing is good for what type of uh, wound? And that will be another lecture. And uh, today we're really con uh, focusing in on the antibiotic part. Okay, so I will deal with this separate uh, 
treatments than with other videos. So let's divide this video now into infections. So today we deal with infections. Which antibiotics do I give? Let's focus on that. Depending now on which stage we have in the wound, the, the, what I mean is that we can have superficial wounds, we can have deeper wounds, we can have systemic uh, infections, then we give different antibiotics. And a general rule is that when we have superficial, then it's usually a mild case, it's usually, uh, uh, usually enough with some oral tablets and that is, that is everything we have to do. When we go uh, with deeper ones, then we go into deeper joints, deeper tissues, then we need usually to give uh, oral tablets and if that is not enough then we go on with intravenous antibiotics and uh, uh, this this is all, all depending on the patient so every patient is different then we, when we go to systemic it's no question we need to treat the patient in the hospital we need to treat him with intravenous antibiotics so and we have different spectrum of pathogens meaning different bacteria superficial ones streptococci Staphylococci, these are general normal flora that you have on your skin. Streptococcus pyogenes, Streptococcus agalactia, we have, for example, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. All these are superficial skin, they're intruding the skin in these skin cracks and thereby they're causing, they're causing the infection. Then if you go deeper, then we can see some enterococci, we can see some enterobacteries here, we can see some anaerobes sometimes and, and we can see pseudomonas. These are a little bit more severe. Then we, if we go deeper, if we have systemic infections, then we can see even more severe stuff. Clostridium, bacteroides, severe anaerobes. These are the more, more, more severe diseases that we need to look at. And of course, we can even make it more severe when we're dealing with MRSA, when we're dealing with pseudomonas that we have in the second case, when we have ESBL, so extended spectrum beta-lactamase, then we're dealing with resistance. We're dealing with the most severe cases where we don't even have antibiotics. So it means that if a patient is resistant to these three things that I mentioned now, vancomycin, uh, so the MRSA to the ESBL and, and so on, pseudomonas, then, if, then we don't have any choice more, we don't have any antibiotics. And that is the race of humans against bacteria. And usually bacteria win. Why? Because the scientists are not so fast as the bacteria are. That means please don't give uh, the most aggressive antibiotic treatment to every patient because then you will build up a resistance and when you need the antibiotic at, at, at most then it's not working anymore. So please only give the lightest the, the, the weakest penicillins, if possible, whenever the uh, infection is very mild, meaning superficial layer, some staphylococci, some streptococci, these are enough, you, you just need penicillins for this. If you go on, then you need some severe, uh, deeper uh, intravenous antibiotics that are working against pseudomonas, MRSA and so on. So, today we will actually divide now uh, the patients into those who are mild, moderate, severe, for example. And this can be done with the classification system that we look at. And based on this classification system, we can decide if the patient will get oral medications or will get uh, intravenous uh, antibiotics. That, uh, that means that we can decide if the patient is at home or if he is treated in a hospital. And we will see now, depending on which bacteria we have, which medications we will give and how often. Okay, so let's check it out now. So let's check this out now. We have this IDSA that we will deal with today. So that is Infectious Disease Society of America. So once again, IDSA, Infectious Disease Society of America. This is a classification system that we divide then these diabetic infections into mild, moderate, or severe. And actually we can say that mild, more, more moderate will have similar treatment. Uh, the only difference here is that in moderate cases we can have uh, oral tablets given with antibiotics and if it's severe then we need to go on with uh, intravenous. So that, that, that's a gray zone. The moderate is the gray zone here. Severe is intravenous, mild is oral tablets and the moderate can be oral or uh, intravenous. And uh, we have to now know what mild means. What, what does mild mean? Mild infection means that we have a cellulitis, for example, cellulitis. So this is an infection now of this uh, tissue that we have, skin and subcutaneous tissue. And if we have then uh, less than two centimeters of cellulitis, or we have uh, more than two inflammatory signs, 
inflammatory signs, you know this, these are the regular, like it is warm, it is red, it is, for example, swelling, it is painful, and so on. This, this is a normal inflammation sign. If you have more than two of these, and together with uh, less than two centimeters of cellulitis, then we can usually say that this is a mild infection. So this wound is mild. If you go on with moderate, we have more than two centimeters cellulitis, we have maybe more than two inflammatory signs, but this is not so important. We have inflammatory signs here also, and we have more than two, two centimeter cellulitis, and we have some lymphangitic streaks. Please, uh, you, will, you will see now uh, some uh, pictures of this, lymphangitic streaks, and we can also have then uh, deep tissue abscess. So deep tissue abscess. If you see these ones, then you know that we are in the moderate one. So remember, two centimeter root of, a rule of cellulitis. Less than two centimeters mild, more than two centimeters moderate. What is about severe? Now, first of all, the moderate also, we are not only dealing with uh, the sub, uh, superficial tissue here, we can actually reach in this moderate case, uh, the joints and bones. And then if it reaches the bones and we are getting osteomyelitis, yeah, then, uh, then it's severe right, once again. So then we can group it into severe. So osteomyelitis is all the time severe. If we have osteomyelitis, we have to give intravenous uh, antibiotics usually, yeah, because it's very hard to treat osteomyelitis. This is an infection of the bones, and as we know, it's very hard to reach bones with antibiotics. Therefore, we have to then diagnose osteomyelitis also. When we are having moderate, we have to think of uh, osteomyelitis, and here are some rules also. If, the, for example, the wound is more than two centimeters, and we see the bone visually, or we can probe the bone, then it's very highly uh, likelihood that this is an osteomyelitis. And especially if you have some other signs with it, for example, that the erythrocyte sedimentation rate is more than 70, and also we see in X-ray that uh, we have some cortical destruction, so the bone destruction. Or we see in MRI that some, uh, uh, we have some edema here also and destruction of the cortical bones because we know MRI is the most specific test, but it's the most expensive test. So we usually start with X-ray here first. So when we have all these uh, symptoms and signs, we will need to treat uh, osteomyelitis as a severe disease with uh, intravenous, uh, intravenous antibiotics in the hospital. Okay, please take that note. And therefore, I'm saying that moderate is like a gray zone. Uh, and actually, depending on the doctor here, you will see some doctors will uh, prefer to do it outpatient, meaning the patient goes home and takes oral tablets. And some patients are more afraid of the situation. And they usually take all these moderate cases into the hospital and then they are getting these intravenous uh, uh, antibiotics, which the best is, is a good question. I would say when we look at resistance, uh, antibiotic resistance, then uh, it is better to treat at home with not so uh, hardcore uh, antibiotics because when the resistance builds up, then we, as we know, this MRSA, Pseudomonas, ESBL will develop and we will get the resistance to these and if we get resistance to these we don't have any medication anymore to give to the patient and the patient will die okay and not only this patient but the whole population will get affected because resistance gets uh, even bright i mean i mean it will be uh, for not for only one person but for everybody almost because resistance increases in the population also indirectly so that was mild, moderate. What about severe? Here we have systemic signs. Okay, that's it. If you remember systemic signs, which are tachycardia, heart rate more than 100, beating heart, blood pressure less than 100. You can remember the 100. Uh, blood pressure less than 90 either, I would say. Hypotension less than 90, uh, tachycardia more than 100. And then you have fever, you have chills, you have some confusion, you have vomiting, you can have some laboratory values like leukocytosis, so leukocytes are increased. You can see azotemia, which is an increased nitrogen in the uh, blood. Also, you can see that increased uh, sugar, so hyperglycemia, and we can see that the pH drops, so uh, uh, acidosis. So when we see all these signs, then you know it's a systemic infection, which means that it's not local anymore. It's just affecting the whole body, the whole uh, organs, the, every, every, everything, the whole blood supply that you have. And therefore you get this systemic infection. So we dealt with mild, moderate, severe. And now depending on this, we will give oral tablet intravenous. Let's start with oral. What oral tablets do we have? That, that will also depend. So first of all, we decide uh, in mild cases that we will give oral tablets. And in moderate cases, usually oral, 
but sometimes intravenous. So now we have grouped that into oral. And now, we, depending on uh, what pathogens we have, then we divide what type of oral medication do we give. Okay, so the classification is good for designing oral or intravenous, and the pathogens are important to decide whether it is amoxicillin clavulinate, whether it is clindamycin, or so on. So we will t t divide these three things uh, now. We will have the first case will be pathogens that are streptococci, staph staphylococci, for example. The, sec the second case will be these also, but together with some hardcore uh, pathogens like MRSA. And the third group, third group is referring to something that we have aerobic gram-negative bacilli and anaerobes. So we had the first group was then streptococci, staphylococci. The second group was when we add an MRSA. And the third group when we add also an aerobic gram-negative bacteria or an anaerobe. Now let's look at the first one. First group, streptococci, staphylococci. We have three main medications here. Amoxicillin clavulinate, we have clindamycin, and we have cephalexin. Cephalexin. That meaning we can have ACC, amoxicillin, clindamycin, cephalexin. Okay? Amoxicillin clavulinate is having a dose of 875, 875 milligram of amoxicillin slash 125 milligram of clavulinate. And this is then a total of one gram, three, two to three times daily. Three times daily. Clindamycin is having a dose of 300 to 450 milligram, three times daily. And then we have cephalexin having a dose of 500 milligram three times daily. This is simple. The first case is very simple. We have every, everything is three times daily. Okay. Then we go on with the second, second point. And the second point is also having a clindamycin, is also having a cephalexin. Amoxicillin we don't use in the second group. We will use that in the third group. So we'll use it in the first and the second, uh, in the third group. Okay. In the second group, we are all, uh, only dealing with clindamycin. We're dealing with cephalexin and we will combine this now. Clindamycin can be given alone, clindamycin 300, 300 milligram to 450 milligram three times daily, or we can give then cephalexin, and then we need to combine it. It's not enough alone, so we give, give it with a trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole. Trimetoprim is then 160 milligram slash sulfamethoxazole 800 milligram. We give two tablets two times daily, together with the cephalexin 500 milligram three times daily. That is one combination, but we can also combine cephalexin with a doxycycline. Then we have cephalexin 500 mg three times daily, together with a doxycycline 100 mg two times daily. Okay, that was an, another, com another combination. Then we have linezolid, we haven't heard about this until now, linezolid 600 mg two times daily. Okay, linezolid, that's, an, that's in the second group which was the second group where we have streptococci, staphylococci, emerse. Now let's uh, turn to the uh, third group. Here we said that we will add this amoxicillin to the play again. So instead of giving cephalexin with trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole, we will instead give amoxicillin clavulinate with trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole. And which are the doses? You should know it by now. Amoxicillin clavulinate is one gram total, which is 875 milligram slash 125 milligram of clavulinate, how many times a day? Two to three times daily. That is given then together with trimetoprim, which was how many milligram? 160 milligram, slash sulfamethoxazole, which was 800 milligram. How many tablets do we give? Two. How many times a day? Two. So we added uh, amoxicillin together with this. Or we can also add an amoxicillin clavulinate to, together with uh, no, we can add uh, trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole together with amoxifloxacin. So trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole together with amoxifloxacin. That's another type. Here, here we are dealing with uh, 400 milligram, 400 milligram one time daily, 400 milligram one time daily. So you see, you need to remember how many times a day also. Moxifloxacin is one time daily. Doxycycline is two times daily. Amoxicillin, clindamycin, cephalexin was three times daily. So you see, you, 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 it's very, uh, linezolid was, for example, uh, two times daily. Okay, so please remember this. I know it's uh, very hard. It's hard for me also. Uh, and, and usually you don't need to remember them by heart. But if you do, then it's advantage because then you, can, you, then you don't need to check them out. Uh, you can just write it in the chart and as a doctor it's very important 
that you have speed, you know what you are doing. Okay, so uh, let, let, let's look at the third group of ones again. So we had amoxicillin clavulinate with trimetropium sulfamethoxazole, or we had trimetropium sulfamethoxazole together with uh, moxifl moxifloxacin. But what about clindamycin? We forgot the clindamycin. As a rule, we can say clindamycin was good for the first group, the second group, and the third group. The only difference is that the clindamycin in the third group has to be combined with uh, ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin, 750 milligram, 750 milligram, once time, uh, two times daily, and levofloxacin, levofloxacin, one time daily. Levofloxacin, one time daily. And we do give this 750 milligram dose, which is the highest dose of this Cipro and levofloxacin, because we are wanting to attack pseudomonas here. So one can say this is the fourth group. What first group was Steptococcus, Staphylococcus. Second one, we added MRSA. The third one, we added aerobic gram-negative bacteria and so on, and we added anaerobes. And the fourth one, I would say we added Pseudomonas, and then we combined clindamycin together with this levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin, because these are very good against Pseudomonas, but we have to give a dose of 750 milligram. Otherwise, if we don't have Pseudomonas, we can give 500 milligram. Okay, so let's recap that once again, just, just the names. First group, amoxicillin, so ACC, amoxicillin clavulanin, together with clindamycin, to, uh, or not together, or clindamycin, or cephalexin. Second group, we had no amoxicillin here. We had cephalexin and clindamycin, and we added linezolate. Third group, we had an amoxicillin clavulanate, but we added trimetropium sulfamethoxazole, or we had uh, trimetropium sulfamethoxazole with moxifloxacin, or we had clindamycin together with this ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin. And in the second group, I also forgot, we had doxycycline, doxycycline together with this cephalexin, cephalexin and uh, doxycycline, or we had cephalexin together with trimetropium sulfamethoxazole. So now you see in the chart here that we have next to me that it is actually very uh, understandable, very understandable the, the, the steps, but sometimes they are confu confusing combinations. And please remember the doses, I will not repeat them once again because I've done that many times now. And please watch the video many times, as many times as you want. And then we will continue now with the intravenous, intravenous part. Because the oral part is very similar to intravenous, but the doses will be a little bit different and the doses uh, and the medications will be a little bit different and the classification also. The intravenous part is, uh, we, we will divide the medications into beta-lactams, uh, the cephalosporin, no, the carbapenems, I would say we will divide them into beta-lactams, then with carbapenems, cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, and then we have uh, the other ones which are against MRSA, so vancomycin, daptomycin, linezolate, okay? These are special ones when we have a resistant, uh, when we have MRSA, so resistance to methicillin, so resistance to penicillins. So let's look at the beta-lactams here. Beta-lactam is a different name here. We have ampicillin sulbactam, ampicillin sulbactam, uh, in the other oral type, we had amoxicillin clavulinate. You see, this is the difference here. Ampicillin sulbactam in intravenous one. And then this is not good against pseudomonas. So therefore, we, we can use that in patients who have uh, no pseudomonas. And it is very important that you only use medications that are uh, specific for the specific uh, pathogens. Why? Because of the resistance. So please never use, uh, for example, uh, the other medications that I want to mention, for example, piperacillin tazobactam, that is good for pseudomonas, please don't use that in a patient that doesn't have pseudomonas because the resistance increases, okay? So the first group, beta-lactam, ampicillin sulbactam, we have uh, no pseudomonas, piperacillin tazobactam with pseudomonas. And a special group that is called astrionam is also in the beta-lactam group. This has to be combined with metronidazole if you want to give it. Uh, and this metronidazole together with astronam is then combined. Uh, the ampicin sulbactam does not have to be combined and the piperazine tazobactam does not have to, uh, uh, you don't need to combine that. Then we go on with the carbapenems. Here we have ertapenem, for example, with no pseudomonas, and then we have uh, metopenem and imipenem with pseudomonas. Okay, then we go on with the uh, fluoroquinolones, for example, uh, or the, now let's go with the cephalosporin. It doesn't matter what, what I say, uh, which group you have. I'm just mentioning, we, we have four, four, four or five main groups. And then we have uh, also uh, cephalosporin, these are the ceftriaxone without pseudomonas, and then you have cefepim or ceftazidim with pseudomonas. 
then we go on with fluoroquinolones, moxifloxacin is the one without pseudomonas, and uh, uh, levofloxacin and ciprofloxacin are against pseudomonas. And then the last group was against MRSA, that is meaning if you have a patient now that has both pseudomonas and MRSA, then you need to do a combination here. And if you want to uh, give against MRSA, then you have to have vancomycin, linazolid or daptomycin. Okay, so this is a combination game that we will do now. Uh, we have a patient now we, who has then MRSA and pseudomonas. Then you have to choose from one of these that we had with against pseudomonas. In the beta-lactam group, we had piperazole and tazobactam, or we had astronam together with uh, metronidazole. Then we, when we look at uh, cephalosporins, we have to use not ceftriaxone, we have to use the ceftazidim and cefepim, but you always have to combine cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, and this astronam together with metronidazole. Please remember this. Beta-lactams does not have to be combined with metronidazole, only astronam in this group. Fluoroquinolones have to be combined with metronidazole and also the cephalosporins. So now we have a patient with pseudomonas and MRSA. We want to give a cephalosporin, then we give a cefepim or we give a ceftazidim together with metronidazole and together with vancomycin, for example, which is against MRSA. Uh, if we want to use fluoroquinolones, then we use levofloxacin or ciprofloxacin together with metronidazole and together with vancomycin because that is MRSA. So you see, if you have a patient who only have pseudomonas, then you don't add vancomycin. If you have a patient who doesn't have any pseudomonas and doesn't have any MRSA, then you just choose the simple ones, which were beta-lactam, ampicillin, sulbactam, cephalosporins were ceftriaxone, then we had uh, fluoroquinolones was this moxi moxifloxacin, and uh, carbapenems were ertapenem. That is enough. These four medications when we don't have an pseudomonas or uh, MRSA. Now let's look at the doses. Uh, the ampicillin sulbactam is 3 grams three times daily. So the beta-lactams usually are three times daily. Then we have uh, beta-lactam, uh, piperazolin, tazobactam, 4.5 gram, three times daily. Or we have this astrionam, two gram, uh, two gram, three times daily, together with this metronidazole, three times, three times daily. Okay. Then we go on with, for example, uh, cephalosporins. Then we have ceftriaxone, one to two gram. Uh, here we are dealing with three times daily. Um, now, one time daily for the ceftriaxone, and then we have uh, for the other cephalosporins that are against pseudomonas, for example, cefepim or ceftazidim, here we give three times daily. Three times daily. So here is also one to two gram. Uh, and then uh, cefepim, uh, one to two, uh, two grams, and, and ceftazidim, one to two gram. And then we have, for example, what we have? Fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones. Here we are dealing with levofloxacin, for example, or ciprofloxacin against pseudomonas, and we said moxifloxacin without pseudomonas. And moxifloxacin has a dose of around uh, 400 milligram, 400 milligram one time daily, and then we have the, uh, the levofloxacin and uh, ciprofloxacin also one time daily. O only difference is that cipro has two times daily. So it's a very, very confusing, I know. So remember just levofloxacin is uh, one time daily. Ciprofloxacin is two times daily. And both of these have uh, 750 milligram, 750 milligram uh, the, in the oral, on the oral group. And in, in, in the intravenous part, here we will have a difference. Instead of giving, for example, 750 milligram ciprofloxacin orally, we will give 400 milligram intravenously. So please remember this because we mentioned the oral ones and I know it's very confusing, but ciprofloxacin is two times daily. That's one difference. And the other difference is that the intravenous dose is 400 milligram instead of 750. Levofloxacin is simple to remember. It's 750 in oral, 750 milligram uh, intravenously. Okay. One time daily, one time daily. Good. And what do we have more? We have uh, carbapenems, ertapenem, ertapenem. Ertapenems, these are given also one time daily. The same as we have this cephalosporin. Ceftriaxone was given one time daily. Uh, uh, those who are not against pseudomonas, so ertapenem and ceftriaxone on one time daily. And then in the other two groups, we had three times daily usually. So we had meropenem and imipenem being then three times daily. So meropenem having also a dose of 
one to two gram, and, and then uh, imipenem having the half of it, so 500 milligram instead, three times daily. So this is the difference here. And then we have vancomycin. This was against MRSA. Here we are dealing with, uh, uh, we have to, depending on the kilogram of the patient, okay, the weight of the patient, we will give 15 to 20 milligram per every kilo. And then uh, you give that also uh, three times daily, three times daily. And then uh, the all uh, daptomycin, I think, was daptomycin. What was daptomycin? We have linezolid was 600 milligram, 600 milligram, two times daily. And the daptomycin was four, I think, four to six milligram, four to six milligram per kilogram. This is very similar to vancomycin. Instead of 15 to 20 milligram, in daptomycin is, is rather four to six milligram. Uh, per kilogram than uh, one time daily, one time daily. So this, this is the difference. So uh, I'm very surprised that I actually remember all, all these things because it's very hard and you don't need to remember this. So as I said, uh, a doctor should know what to uh, search for. It doesn't have to remember all the doses, but I try to remember them because it will help me in the process of treating patients uh, because it will get faster and everything that you have in your mind, mind is usually better if you, if, uh, because you can grasp the information and uh, see the connections at, uh, as I'm doing now. Okay, so that was the severe treatment. And as you see, all these uh, medications that are listed now, all the therapies was for severe diseases and uh, as a rule of thumb, as we said, beta-lactams should uh, not be combined, only this astronam, the fluoroquinolone or cephalosporin combined with this metronidazole 500 milligram, and depending on pseudomonas or MRSA, then you need to choose which type of medication that I explain now. And the oral part, we discussed that, that is for mild to moderate, and then this intravenous is moderate to severe, and also if you have patients with osteomyelitis, then you give the same treatment as you give to severe patients, so these intravenous medications. And usually the time frame how, how much you give it that depends on the patient on the clinical signs but I would say usually when we have a severe disease it can take weeks so you have to actually count on that that this will not take one week it can take many weeks be before the patient starts to really heal uh, when we are dealing with mild cases it can take one to two weeks with oral tablets but when we're dealing with intravenous it can be some patients have four weeks in the hospital or so six weeks in the hospital so I think that is enough and please check this video as many times as you want. And please remember one thing, this presentation is about diabetic foot infections. But I will say that the, the medications that I mentioned here will be good for all the other infections that you will deal with in your practice or as a doctor because these doses are the same. These medications are the same. A beta-lactam is always a beta-lactam. So once you learn this video, you will actually learn almost all the other infections also. So uh, this is very helpful. Therefore, I try to remember that. Thank you very much and take care. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.